Okay. I give you a few extra minutes today. 9.33. I gave you extra minutes today because preaching was extra long today. You ever feel that nobody ever listens to you? <laughs> yeah, what's that? <laughs> Everybody having a good time. <laughs> Are you going to Bible class, Sunday school now? All right, I think we're beginning to settle down just a little, just a little. You know, I may have to do this, what I do with my kids when I was a teacher, just raise your hand up. Everybody raise your hand up. That means everybody's got attention. Oh, oh, look at this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah there you go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Raise your hand up. Yeah. That brings a, brings a quiet over the crowd. We're in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, it's the parable of, well, laborers in the vineyard is what it's called. Yes, the parable of laborers in the vineyard. And uh, there's 18 verses, 16 verses to the parable. I'm going to read it so people on Facebook can uh, hear it. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and at about three in the afternoon did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long being, doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foremen, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. All right, looking at the various questions to approach this today. Who is the main character in the story? Landowner. Uh, was the householder here a man of his word or not? Was he unjust? He was not unjust. With what group only did the master promise a set pay scale? The first group. He didn't promise a set pay scale for any other, other groups he hired that day. He only set one for the first group in the morning. This is important because when you look at this story, I'm going to throw it out now. What do you think this parable is? What is Jesus trying to communicate about this parable? What is he trying to communicate through this parable? Just brainstorm. 
brainstorm means you can't go wrong. I'm not going to say wrong. What? <laughs> huh? Taxes are evil. Wrong. No. <laughs> <laughs> People should mind their own business. Oh, there you go. There's the parable. Yeah. Don't work. Yeah. Uh, wait till it comes to John. You get what you get and what? Oh, don't throw a fit. Yeah. Um, one of the things to think about is people kind of look at this as communicating something about salvation. And... Um, I think that's where you run into some issues when you look at this one about salvation. I think what this parable is about is grace. What is grace? You know? And when you look at this parable, the explanation and definition of grace really comes out. Instead of focusing on about, you know, people being saved at the last moment of life, heard people look at this parable and say, this doesn't seem fair that, you know, God's going to the deathbed conversions. I get that question a lot about the deathbed conversions. Uh, why would you put any sock in a deathbed conversion? There's not much I can really uh, speak against a deathbed conversion because in the end, who, who is, who is going to be the ultimate judge? God, I, I, I can't, I, what, what can we only respond on? I can only respond on when people tell me that they believe in Jesus, you know? Uh, and then with that, I give them forgiveness in Christ. You can't, you can't get forgiveness in Christ unless you believe in Christ. It, it makes sense, but does that have to happen all years of your life, or can you get that forgiveness at the last moment as well? I, I'm okay and comfortable with that. I Again, the sincerity of the heart, I'm not going to judge that. I can only judge by what they tell me and let God be the judge in the end. But yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Jonathan was over here right about, you know, you get what you get and don't complain. And that's what happens in grace. People get what they don't deserve. That's what this parable is about. And so these people who are complaining, they are really complaining <clears throat> against what? They're complaining against grace. People don't like grace. Isn't that what the guy says in the parable? You mad at me because I am generous, which is grace. <laughs> no. So one of the situations when you look throughout these uh, this parable the Roman Catholic Church I found this interesting article working in my dissertation stuff how they have three different types of merit and this parable it illustrates each one of them a strict merit a condign merit and a congruent merit a strict merit in the Roman Catholic understanding is the idea is this is an agreement this is a pact I made with you you do this you get that so which of the uh, people, which groups of people were under the strict merit? The first, the first group. The condign merit are those that like, there's no really agreement. You go out and you just kind of do something for uh, the, the person, the big boss, and he gives you what you want. And so that one would be like the second groups. They go out and work a little bit. And the congruent merit is, is just totally given, like uh, an act of grace. Um, but we don't have all these kind of terminologies in our church, and I'm very thankful for it because it's hard to even keep all track of that. But I look at this parable as an illustration, really, of the simple fact of grace and how people can be frustrated with grace, just frustrated with it. And they forget how they need grace in their own lives. Um in, in 1D, what do you think was the driving force of the landlord to hire more workers? Why was he doing this? Okay, he's going to be in a deadline. So if you think of that, the landowner's motivation is what? 
self-serving. Now, if we're going to continue to stay with this landloader being God, he's out looking for workers for what reason? Compassion. People who are idle are not fulfilling their creation. I'm going to give you an opportunity to fulfill what you were created for. You were created to work. And here, I'm going to give you opportunities for work if no one else is. So, um, what was the master saving uh, by hiring the workers at any day rather than just by giving them a denarius as charity? And uh, that is, I think the word is supposed to be saying, not saving. What was the master saying by hiring the workers at the end of the day rather than just give them a denarius as charity? He was just saying, I'll give you whatever is right. And I already talked about that. How does Jesus increase the intensity of rage in the characters in this parable? Um, how does he communicate these people are envious of grace? Yes. And they had to see it. Mm -hmm. If he would have just started with the first hires and gave them an anarius, do you think they would have stuck around and see what everybody else was getting paid? <laughs> they, wouldn't have, they wouldn't have seen it. They wouldn't have complained. They would have just gone on their merry way. So the, the master is is trying again to communicate grace. And they, he wants all to see what grace means. Um, and the words of the hired workers, you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day, the burden of the work and the heat of the day. It really sets up that these people are very, very angry. Uh, uh, Bailey, who writes on this parable, writes, uh, not fair shouts the leader, we should receive more. This is not the cry of the underpaid. No one is underpaid in the parable. The complaint is from the justly paid who cannot tolerate grace. Grace is not only amazing, it is also for certain types infuriating. Yeah, Amy? Yeah, but can't, can't you say it would be grace as well to not want Mm -hmm. So it's either set it in order and not upset everybody and was gracious to everybody the same exact way. Yeah. So the parable is set up. He does rock the boat. He does rock the boat. The parable is set up to rock the boat because Jesus is going to turn our world upside down. I mean, think about it. When he comes in and explains to the people of Israel what the kingdom of God is all about. He's always rocking the boat. When, what exactly, why was he crucified? Because he's rocking the boat. Yeah. You know, this kind of scripture is rare because throughout the Bible, the time of Joseph and his brothers, the time of, uh, uh, you know, everybody seeing with the uh, prodigal son, mm -hmm. everybody seeing on that, everybody gets to get their spot. They're due. They're, yes, exactly. They're due to the Lord. It seems like this is a good kind of grace through a lot of things in the Bible. Yeah, uh, grace grace is not easily easily received by sinful humankind, and and uh, you know, and going back to that point of rocking the boat, sometimes you you have to look at this and and, and looking at Christ being God of the flesh that He can't make mistakes. Is He choosing the best way to communicate this by rocking the boat? I mean, he does rock the boat. And it's kind of like we sometimes, in our own communication, right? Sometimes the only way we're going to get it through is by shock value. And, and if Jesus could have communicated grace in a better way to his hearers, he probably would have said it. But the shock value and the rocking the boat is the most effective way he chooses to communicate what grace is all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's not only it's not only quoted there, like you said, Tom. And you can see that verse in other places in the Bible. So, kind of continuing on with Bailey says, "No one's underpaid. The complaint is from the justly paid who cannot tolerate grace. Grace is not only amazing; it's also for certain types of period." Later, Bailey says about the owner, "He offers a hand up, not a hand out. He tries deliberately to educate the entire workforce in these matters." So what would have been 
a handout instead of a hand up. Just give them money. Work and justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you want to talk about work and justice, and, and we are a world that loves to look at justice. And somebody shared this with me in my college days. Has, has God really been just with us? We want justice, and 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 do you really want to ask justice from God for yourself? No, no. <laughs> no, you don't. What do you want to ask from God? You want to ask grace, right? Grace, yeah. Because God, God has found another way to execute His justice against sin without having to take it out on us, and that's that's a blessing. So we don't really want God to deal with us justly. We want to have God deal with us in His grace. It's indirect, you know. What, but there's one. When, when a lot of people go to this parable, they want to talk about that the direct message is salvation, but really it's about grace, which is the foundation of salvation. So when you look at salvation, then you get into the question of the deathbed conversions. Right, grace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So grace is really what we're going to hear, Holly. That's the part that I think always matters in any group of any story is like yeah. your intentions are pure or not. And I think in this story, I'm assuming they did have an idea. They didn't put it on purpose. Well, let's put yourself in the story. You're there in the morning, eight o'clock, work starts out, and and he already offers you the deal. I'm gonna I'm gonna pay you a denarius. And and you know, not everybody gets hired during the day. There's 50 other people in the marketplace. Nobody picked them up. So he goes out, and he, and he and you're one of the 50 that weren't picked up in the first time. So he goes out and he asks you to work in your vineyard. What would you do when he said, uh, go out and work my vineyard? What would you say? How much? Right? <clears throat> then you know your intent. But that they don't ask that question. Yeah, yeah. How much are you going to pay me? It's, it's fascinating. They don't, they don't ask the question. So what do they understand about this landowner? Yeah, he's generous, he's going to be fair, and, and whatever is going to pay us. Because who are the only ones that complain? The ones that had the agreement. The ones who never had the agreement, even the ones that were hired at 9 o'clock in the day, they weren't complaining. It was those that were hired first in the day. Those that had the agreement um, were the ones that, in the story, Christ brings out as the one complaining against this this concept of grace and justice. But I think one to look at it is to to look at intent um, would be to place ourselves in the story. Would we do this? Would you do that? Would you would you just go and work for somebody without them telling you how much you're going to get? Oh, we don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you if you know if you know the person and you know they're fair and they're just, yeah, you you go with it. But if it's a complete stranger, probably you want something kind of written agreement. Like I have to you know, we created a story for the first time like right the answer. They basically live there, they want to lie. Thank you. New people get all of the pie, you know. And then uh some high scales, especially teachers, the uh, newer teachers get uh, higher rate of uh, raises and the old teachers are very struggling because of that. Yeah. And if all your gifts are from God, you know, you're grumbling against God. Well, um, I don't know if you want to compare apples with oranges. <laughs> because the system in that teaching situation is really run by man, not by God. So I, I, I think in that situation, you got to really strong argument for justice of complaint like we need to be treated equally 
yes, the young teacher may not get as much money, but their increases and in their percentages should be the same throughout because this is a world where you uh, you seek justice. Between man to man, you want justice. But between man and God, you want grace. Yeah, there's a difference. That's all three values for man. They want to get and beat those employees that they hire. Yes, retention. And uh, home uh, or standard on the piece of wood. No, he wasn't. I mean, you think about, again, go to that retention uh, concept you're talking about, Chester. And so the motivation is, again, selfish. Where in the landowner, the motivation is self is other-centered, altruistic. Again, we, we, it's just an entirely different There's setup and picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I have a question. Yeah. If you agree to work for a denarius, doesn't that just that's, the denarius doesn't really count as a as resembling grace because you agreed to work for it and that's that it that cancels it out. Yeah. So it's the that's rest justice. Of them yeah. that, that ended up with the, grace. They did right. The first one got justice. The rest of them all got grace. <coughs> you know, denarius was the was the pay the usual pay for a day's work. And like other people have told me, when people complain about their wages, the employer can basically tell them what. Yeah, there's the door. I mean, hey, you, 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 I, I did. This is what I told you. If you don't like it, then you don't have to stay. We'll find somewhere else. Um, and in this parable, again, we're looking at a communication of grace, grace, what grace really is. And how sometimes <laughs> we people get upset with grace and we see it happening in the lives of others, not our own. We, we expect justice. That's just the way our nature, that's the way our human nature is built. Um, so who are the workers? Are they the Pharisees, the disciples, or you? C.H. Dodd says, there are those who seek to dictate God's will regarding others. The workers, the very first workers, are those who said, this is the way you should treat these other people. It, you know, yeah. Do you think that's our role, that we should tell God how we should run his business? But when we complain about grace, are we not? And it exactly doesn't that what the landowner says? He says, uh, in verse 13, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? I take your pay and go. I want to give it to the one who was hired last, the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Doesn't God have the right to do what he wants to do with his own creation? And who are we to be judging that? Um, we, we, we have judge, we, we question uh, his, his justice in the world when, when bad things happen. But we also sometimes, like this parable, may even question when he dispenses his grace in ways we just, yeah, we like grace, but we don't think you should give that much grace away. Because that just makes us equal with those people who got more grace than we did or whatever. Um, what, what is the Christian truth is communicated by the fact that the house owner goes to the marketplace in search of workers rather than just send one of his uh, menial stewards to do the task. What's the message? That but the landowner usually doesn't do these things. He sends his servants. Why does he go? What is it? What is communicated about the landowner? He's caring. He, he's got compassion in his heart for these people. He could have just had somebody else go and hire more, but he wanted to do it personally. Any other thoughts or questions on Matthew 20, 1 through 16? Um, if not, let's go to Matthew 20, 17 through 28. And you can see the other um, versions found in Mark 10 and Luke 18. Uh, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? 
We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So in, in, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, who's making the request? Look at Mark 10, 32. Who's making the request in Mark 10, 32? Uh-huh. Um, in Mark 10, 32, we see the request coming up in verse 35. Who makes the request in verse 35, 10, 35? Is there a contradiction here? Kind of. All right, you biblical scholars, work it out. <laughs> I figured uh, Jesus told mom, uh, that's not how it is, and she didn't bother telling her son, so that they went. Okay, right. okay. That, that could work. That could work. That could work. That uh, it didn't work with mom, maybe we need to go do it ourselves. Another uh, aspect is to understand that uh, Mark is not recorded, but that James and John are asking this indirectly through her, their mother. So that actually, even though Mark doesn't say the mother asked it, she really did. But James and John, he, Mark wanted to make sure that James and jo John were behind it. Because in, in Matthew, who is the one that really seems to be behind the request? It's, it's really the mother. Uh, it's like James and John doesn't even know that this is going on. But uh, Mark wants it to be known. No, this is coming from uh, James and John. And they kind of want Mary, I mean, the, their mother to do it. Why, why the mother, not themselves? Why the mother, not themselves? Yeah, yeah. And more receptive to the mother than, than them. Uh, it would be like, Mom's going to be heard better than we are about this. So, Maybe now it's always asked more than <laughs> Is that, yeah. <laughs> There's always seemed to be somebody a little bit better at intercession than ourselves. And it, it, you, it, the same thing with in po political affairs, you find the ambassador, the person that's going to be the best ambassador to go ask a request. So the mother is the ambassador, but the one behind it is James and John. Um, 21, what's the problem with 21? Verse 21 in Matthew 20. What's the problem with Matthew 20, 21? Very good. You had good confirmation class, Holly. <laughs> Credit to your confirmation teacher. <laughs> yeah. Jesus should know the answer, right? Why does he even bother to ask the question? What does, this, what does this say, though, about prayer? That even though uh, God knows everything, we still need to ask. Ask. We need to verbalize. We need to verbalize more for our own benefit than for his benefit. So Jesus sees the mother of the sons of Zebedee uh, coming for request, and he asks her to verbalize it, even though he could read her mind. But the helpful aspect of verbalization is our, who's, who's benefit? Ours, so that we can know the story, we can know the thought process. If this was all done telepathically, how much could we in 2022 know what was going on here? You know, nothing. So she asked that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Why is this request coming right now? I think the answer you can find again in Mark 10, 32. What does Mark 10, 32 bring to the table on this? Um, what is Jesus basically saying in 10, 32? Mark 10, 32, what uh, background does Jesus give about this situation? His time is short. 
His time is short, and all through these years, for three years, he's been talking about this thing happening in Jerusalem. And so James and John are thinking, what? Huh? What's going to happen soon? Hmm? His death and his death understood that when Jesus talked about his death, it was going to usher in what? The kingdom of God. So James and John are like, hey, let's get it first. <laughs> Isn't that what they're doing here? And, 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 and they're smart. They're smart. Jesus has been talking about the kingdom of God's going to be ushered in. He's going to go into Jerusalem and, and, and he's going to become the Messiah. And, and so we need to go first. And that's why when I kind of like what, uh, uh, go back to Matthew 20, 24, when the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. They were indignant for what reason? They didn't think of it first. <laughs> you know, they, they got caught sleeping and napping. So they were indignant toward the brothers that they were probably smarter. But, but I don't think they were really indignant that they bothered to ask. They were indignant because they, they got beat to the punch. Um, so Jesus, again, working with their ignorance, tries to tell them, what does this mean to be in my kingdom? What is he? What is he? Uh, what are the qualifications in verse in Matthew 20, uh, 22? You got to do what? Drink the cup I'm going to drink. Did you think James and John understood this? So what's the cup that God was going to Jesus was going to drink here? His death. When you talk about the wrath, I mean the cup of. Have you ever heard this? It's in the Bible. The cup of wrath. Whose wrath? And where did Jesus drink the cup of God's wrath? On the cross. Can you actually think you can do this? Can you drink the cup of my father's wrath? Of course, Jesus doesn't come out really explicit, but when you put the scriptures together, that's what's really going on here. You know, can you drink this cup? Can you drink the cup of persecution and martyrdom and wrath of God? And they think they think he's just speaking on the on the surface. We can. And Jesus says, yeah, you're going to drink it, but probably not, he's not going to drink at the level he did. How are they going to drink the cup that uh, Jesus is? What's going to happen to James and John? They'll be martyred. They'll die for the faith. They'll die for the faith, but Jesus dies for, for the sins. See the difference? Jesus dies for the sins. James and John dies for the faith. And, and which one involves the wrath of God? Dying for faith or dying for sins? Dying for sins. Yeah. Uh, and what does Jesus basically say about these two places? They're not his to give away. Uh, they've been prepared, which means they've been prepared how long ago? A long time ago. And in the end, in verse 24 uh, through 28, what kind of attitude are the Christians supposed to have? Hmm? Service. Um, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Any thoughts or additions to those three pericopes on this narrative here about the mother's request or James and John's request for service? Anything that you have an aha moment today with? Moving on to Bartimaeus. Please note where we're at chronologically. Verse 29, and in chapter 21, 1, what's going to happen in 21, 1? Palm Sunday. So you got to understand that these things are taking place as Jesus is moving into Palm Sunday. And that's again, James and John, they're on top of it. Hey, he's going in. The kingdom is coming down. We need to get in before they do. Um, and so this is on a movement from Galilee into the city of Jerusalem. All the, all the disciples have do this every year. What's being celebrated on, the, on uh, Palm Sunday? What's being celebrated this week, coming up this week in the history? 
Passover. And what was the rule? If you were male, you had to be in Jerusalem, no matter where you were in the world. You needed to be in Jerusalem three times a year, Passover, Feast of Booths, and Pentecost. Here, the disciples were heading into Jerusalem for their obligatory celebration of Passover. What's really fascinating, and I think we'll pick this up on Palm Sunday a little bit. I don't know if I've got that here today, but we'll, we'll break into it. But the day of Passover is supposed to be on the 14th of Nisan. And so, uh, which is Thursday, Friday, however you want to work this calendar out. And anybody know what you were supposed to do in the household on the 10th day of Nisan? Anybody know your Jewish history? Sure, you all know your Jewish history. You know your Jewish liturgy. Richard, you know what, right? <laughs> but you just got to let somebody else answer. <laughs> on the 10th day of the month. Huh? Oh, you're talking to him. No, that was on the 14th. The 10th day of the month, you were to bring in the lamb to the house. And so when Jesus is entering the city of Jerusalem, what are the Jewish people doing? Bringing their lambs into the house. Jesus is going into the house of God. He's the lamb of God. This is fascinating. Yeah. On the 10th day of the month, as lambs are being brought into the house, Jesus is being brought into the house of God. So you got this cute little lamb for, from on the 10th day of the month. And what are you supposed to do with it on the four days later? What do you think kind of impact that has on the kids in the household? Huh? Think about it. Huh? Heartbreaking. Why? Why? What? What is? What message is God trying to communicate by having His descendants of Abraham do this? You take in this cute little lamb, you pet it, you cuddle it, you feed it for four days. On the fourth day, you slit its throat in front of your family. What is God trying to communicate with this? Huh? <laughs> in an innocent land, Jesus is an innocent land. He's, he's trying to communicate just how bad sin is. Right? What is what is his what is God the Father doing on the 14th day? He's slicing the lamb of his son. And, and the people of Israel were supposed to try and catch this, that this is how bad sin is. But it's heartbreaking to, to take this pet and then to slice its throat and eat it? Well, it's not a pet, but don't you think you kind of fall in love with that cute? Think of it, you come with this cute little cuddly lamb, you know, on the 10th day. And you, and you, and you, and you tell your kids, hey, uh, feed, the, feed the lamb, would you, you know, feed the lamb, water the lamb today, you know, I'm, I'm busy. Don't you think these kids are going to fall in love with it, Steve? <laughs> To keep yourself emotionally distant. <laughs> yeah. It all happens. It happens when you name it. I wonder if they gave it a name. You don't know. I mean, that'd be kind of interesting. Did it not says in the Bible to give it a name, but you wonder, you take the lamb in on the tenth day and you make it a household pet. Did you I wonder if they ever named it? Don't name your food. <laughs> Plan yeah. So this is what's going on. It, it's 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 approaching the, the 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 temple and it's approaching the festival. Yes. Marriage. They're not named. Do not name these cattle. Yeah. <laughs> For her, they were becoming a pet, and he knew that they were going to be slaughtered. Right. Yeah. So there is something so to naming. Naming personalizes exactly. things. It does. Yeah. So when we look at this last healing of uh, today, before Jesus goes into the city of Jerusalem, uh, Matthew 10, 20, 29, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight 
and they followed him. Um, let's look at how Mark records it. How many people are blind in Matthew 20? Two. Two. Let's, let's, let's look at Mark's record. Mark chapter 10, 46. One. Just indicates one. Again, this whole thing between Matthew and Mark, um, what's going on with the intercession? What is, do we really need two characters in Matthew to have the intercession or can one do the job? One can do the job. Again, Mark is just saying, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take the speaker. You know, here he's gonna take the speaker where uh, Matthew wants to record, there were two of them but the message can be delivered by one. What does the name Bartimaeus mean? Anybody know that? Uh, Timaeus. So it's kind of cool that one of the gospel writers will call him Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus. Bar is Hebrew word for son. And Timaeus is the name of the father. So let's, uh, let's think about this, you know, uh, Bar, son. Was there another bar that has a great impact in the gospel? Barabbas. Barabbas. Let's break that down. Let's break that down. Barabbas. Break your name down. Break it down. Bar Abba. Son of the Father. Hmm. The son of the Father, Barabbas, is given in exchange for the son of the Father. That's also an interesting parallel of how God controls history. Barabbas, son of the father. And actual, the son of the father is the one that actually goes to death. Um, Barabbas could have been, you know, Jesus was a common name too. Everyone was named their child Joshua, Jesus. But it's it's got to be God planned that that was actually the name of the person that was the thief. That was given in exchange. Um, so Matthew differs on the place of healing. This can be also like he was in Jericho or on the way out of Jericho. Again, that is not a real major discrepancy. Uh, why were the people telling blind men are meant to be quiet? Hmm? Right. Yeah. And they almost kind of thought that they were beyond help. Jesus can't do anything for you. Because if they believed that Jesus could do something for them, I think they would have just ushered him in. For some reason, at this point in time, they just felt that they were a burden. Liability. Kind of what I mentioned in the message today. Not worthy of Christ's attention. And, and Christ does uh, confront them. And again, what, what is kind of confusing about verse... Uh, 32? Yeah, he knows what they need, so why does he bother to ask the question? Again, verbalize your request, and that helps also the reader of 2022 kind of hear the passion of the heart. It also spoke, spoke to the crowd. That too, right, yeah. Back in those times and today time as well. Um, and so in Matthew 6, 8, I'm just going with the idea, verbalize your prayers. How does Matthew describe the healing differently? Uh, Matthew says he only, he does what? He touches their eyes. What does Mark say about the healing of the blind man? He didn't do anything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see a little bit why the, the historical critics uh, question the inspiration of scripture, you know, you've got these conflicts and these discrepancies. Does does that mean lead, lead to conclude that these things have got errors and therefore you can't trust it? Uh, that's where the historical critics like to go. And we believe these things can be worked out. That they may seem to be a little bit of a discrepancy, but that's not a discrepancy that if we were there, seeing this happen, we could see that they both were yeah, the same. people tell you a story today. Different. Yeah. Right. It's kind of like, I always said this thing, you know, if uh, you have four four newspapers recording, let's say, Waxahachie basketball game, are all four newspapers going to report it the same way? 
you know, some basic facts, but they're all, they're they're going to throw in their angles and their perspectives and what they want to focus on. Yeah, what they was important. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so next week we go into Holy Week, and the Bible for most of these gospel readers slow down because this is where they want to really focus the reader on the passion of Christ as it is the foundation of the Christian faith. So verse 20 to 28, eight chapters just dealing with the passion and the resurrection in Matthew and the same can be found in Mark. A lot of uh, emphasis on that. Any other questions before we close up today? Yeah, on anything. You got something, Chris Chester? <laughs> Yeah, Cecilia's on it. And uh, they were talking about Luther and the roses, and I, I never even heard of that, that Luther do the rosary. They don't do the rosary. Well, I, I Googled it, and, and they do. You can even buy the, uh, the rosary. It's different from the Catholic. Well, the rosary there's a whole lot of vocabulary in there. Well, that's the deal. Um, according to this one person, said it has to be done properly and not in the Catholic way where you invoke the saints and, and uh, worship Mary. But uh, you go through Luther and uh, Luther. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it, 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 what are, I don't know, some of you may be ex Catholic converts. Uh, the rosary is a is an instrument for the spiritual devotion of the Roman Catholic faith, so that they don't lose track, because they've got beads on a string, and so when they go to penance and make confession before the priest, and the priest says, "Oh, that was a that was a big sin. That's going to be ten Our Fathers and five Hail Marys." So after you say one Our Father, after you leave the confession booth, what are you supposed to do with the bead? switch it over so you know oh god i got one done so now i need nine more uh and so therefore god forbid he was told to do 10 that they do 11 so you know they 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 just use those beads to keep track of the penance they're supposed to do if you want to use a tracking record for your own prayers but not for the idea of the roman catholic atonement satisfaction and this yeah maybe it can be a good devotional thing for the for the lutheran church so the individual is right. You've got to use it the Lutheran way. Um, if if you find anything that is helpful in your spiritual devotion, use it. Uh, but I have never heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got to be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I. But I, I I would like to know how they're using them. That's that's the question. How are they using them? And what are they using them for? Um, you know, Seth was in Italy for a year, not a year, half a year. And and he he didn't know what he bought, but he thought it was nice looking and everything like that. So he, he bought he bought something, gave it to his mom, and it turned out to be a rosary. He didn't even know what it was. It just looked nice. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. They are they are beautiful things. And and again, it's kind of in our situation in our church. We will put a statue or a paintings or anything else for the sake of increasing our devotional uh, approach. So if it helps with devotion, great. But if it becomes an idol, that's when it becomes wrong. Or if it's not used, if the devotional tool is not used scripturally, then it becomes wrong too. I want, this was at a Lutheran gathering. I think it was Steve Gathering where he made uh, prayer beads. Uh, prayer beads, yeah. And I, I put the people that you pray for. That I pray for every day. It's kind of like a rosary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there, that's a, that's a way to use it. Is to read, if you if you use the beads as not to remind how many prayers you did, but you use the beads as to remind you to pray for for the country, for your family. Yeah. You know, they're they're if you use them as a, again devotional aspect. There, that could be of helpful tool. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you, O Lord, for this day, and we thank you for the Lamb of God. O Lord, we help to understand just what it cost, our sin cost you, when we really understand the Passover ritual 
and what happened with that lamb and, and what the family had to give up in order to understand exactly what you gave up for them, uh, the slaughter of the firstborn of the Egyptians in order that they may be free. For you, for us, you gave up the slaughter of your own firstborn so that we may be free. We thank you for this gift and act of love and ask that you would continue to just help us treasure this and share this love with others. So as we go through this uh, COVID situation, people will not be dismayed, dismayed about your love, but that you will, they will know that you love them regardless of all things and that you will see us through because of your faith and commitment to us. We thank you, O Lord, for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs> <clears throat> Is that uh, uh, the prayer beats for the NFL for Vi to put a Viking bead on? Well, hey Lance, I'm going to get you some beads. I'm going to I'm going to make one of the Vikings, okay, for you. 